this is not the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, and this is still part of our lectures or discussions in contemporary philosophy, specifically in existentialism and phenomenology. So, something about the life and the works of Martin Heidegger. Heidegger, one of the foremost philosophers in the 20th century, was born on September 26, 1889, in Meskertz in Southwest Germany. Um, he was born to a Catholic family. His father worked as a sexton in the local church. Uh, sexton is somebody who takes care of the church or the churchyard. He could also work as a sacristan or a janitor or uh, a graveyard uh, caretaker. So in his early youth, uh, Heidegger was being prepared uh, for the priesthood. And in 18, uh, 1903, he went to the high school in Constance, where the church supported him with a scholarship. Of course, uh, obviously, uh, the people want, uh, supported his um, education, probably expecting that he would be a priest someday. Um, then in 1906, he moved to Freiburg. And then in 1909, after completing uh, his high school studies, secondary studies, he became a Jesuit novice. So early on, uh, uh, Heidegger was uh, entered the seminary to be a priest. But he was discharged within a month for poor health reasons, you know, for reasons of poor health. He took up studies in philosophy, in mathematics, and in natural sciences. And it was at the time that he first became influenced by the philosophy of Edmund Husserl. So he studied uh, Husserl's logical investigations, one of the important works of Husserl. And then in 1913, he completed a doctorate in philosophy, uh, writing a dissertation uh, with the title, The Doctrine of Judgment in Psychologism, under the direction of the new Kantian philosopher, Heinrich Rickert. Now, the outbreak of the First World War interrupted Heidegger's academic career, and he was listed into the army. But again, because of poor health, um, he was discharged only after two months. And hoping to take over the chair of the Catholic, of Catholic philosophy at Freiburg, Heidegger began to work on a habilitation thesis. This is a requirement to qualify for teaching at the university. And he wrote a thesis entitled Don Scotus Doctrine of Categories and Meaning. He completed this in 1915. And in the same year, he was appointed as a private docent or a lecturer. So that's the lowest uh, level of teaching in the university, a lecturer. Um, normally, a lecturer is not, uh, is not a paid position. No? Uh, you be, uh, when, when you're promoted to a higher uh, level, then you get, uh, it becomes a, a paid position. No? Basically, those who reach the rank of professors, they are already paid handsomely. Now, in 1916, Heidegger became a junior colleague of Edmund Husserl, who joined the Freiburg faculty. No? In his career, uh, Husserl would uh, transfer to Freiburg. And then the following year, he got married and he married Thea Alfred Petri, a Protestant student okay, who had attended his courses since the fall of 1915. Right? Uh, that's the year that he became uh, a lecturer. His career was um, again interrupted by military service in 1918, serving for the last 10 months of the First World War. Immediately after his return to Freiburg, 
he announced his break from the system of Catholicism, system of Catholicism, and got appointed as Husserl's assistant. And he started lecturing in a new, insightful way. And his lectures in phenomenology and his creative interpretations of the philosophy of Aristotle would earn him a wide acclaim. He would become very uh, popular to the, to the students in, in the university. In 1923, with the support of Paul Nator, Heidegger was appointed associate professor at Marburg University. So he got a higher uh, position in another university. And between 1923 and 1928, he enjoyed there the most fruitful years of his entire teaching career. Okay, fruitful in his teaching career, but uh, he was not as productive when it comes to publication. Now, Heidegger extended the scope of his lectures, of his teachings, and taught courses on the philosophy of, on the history of philosophy, uh, logic, uh, phenomenology, the philosophy of Plato, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, Immanuel Kant, and Leibniz. So he expanded the scope of his lectures. However, Heidegger had not published uh, anything since 1916 when he uh, published his, uh, his thesis, his habilitation thesis, a factor that threatened his future academic career. We know that uh, at the time in Europe, uh, the, the saying goes, publish or perish. If you don't publish, then you will, you, your, your uh, academic career will greatly suffer. So you have to, aside from teaching, you have to publish something, no, not just teach and teach and teach you have to you have to publish something because that's where your uh, uh, academic uh, academic reputation is based so finally in february of 1927 well partly because of the ad, uh, pressure from the administration that he must publish something um, he published his fundamental treatise entitled The Being in Time. We published Being in Time. Uh, it was an unfinished work no? because uh, in the bigger, in the grand uh, project, philosophical project of Heidegger, he wanted to, um, his, his main interest really is in ontology, the philosophy of being. But the being in time, only contain his discussion about the Dasein. No? The Dasein, because he said that, well, before we can ask the question about the meaning of being, we have to ask first about the inquirer. Okay, the being who can inquire about the meaning of being. And that being who can inquire about the meaning of being is a Dasein or man. So, the entire being in time that was published in 1927 mainly focused on the Dasein, on the existentials of Dasein, the temporality of Dasein, etc., etc. So it's it's an unfinished work, but it was recognized to be a truly epoch-making work of the 20th century. And it earned Heidegger great acclaim and actually earned him full professorship at Marburg because of that one publication the being in time he got promoted to a full to and be a full professor you know, the same year that he published that published the work now a year later after heidegger or hauser's retirement uh, from teaching he was appointed chair of the philosophy of philosophy at freeburg university so from freeburg he went to marburg and then he went back to freeburg and was appointed the chair of philosophy uh, replacing uh, Edmund Husserl. Now, although being in time is dedicated to Husserl, because uh, Heidegger followed the philosophy and applied the phenomenology of, of Husserl. And Husserl was actually very delighted. Uh, and he anticipated that Heidegger would continue his project in phenomenology. But, <clears throat> 
It already contains ideas that are either far or contrary from the main ideas of Husserl, from the phenomenological position of Husserl. The publication of The Being in Time, Heidegger, marks the departure of Heidegger from the phenomenology or from Husserl's brand of phenomenology. And uh, consequently, the difference between these two philosophers and their difference in their in their thoughts, in their philosophies, would uh, become apparent that they act, they would actually have some some kind of falling off. No? Uh, uh, there would be a, a, a kind of academic distance, so to speak, between these two great these two great thinkers. Right? So, in 1929. His next published works, What is Metaphysics? On the Essence of Ground and Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, further reveal how far Heidegger have moved away from you know, the new Kantian and phenomenological uh, notion of phenomenological consciousness of Husserl. And he would develop his own version of phenomenological ontology. Because as I've said, the main uh, interest of Husserl or, or Heidegger rather is not really on uh, in, in phenomenology but in ontology. But he used the phenomenological approach of Husserl to develop his own phenomenological ontology. We will we will be uh, we will explain that later. Right now, in 1930. Uh, Heidegger's life entered a controversial state. Okay. Uh, the, one of the most controversial uh, decisions of Heidegger in his career. Uh, this is connected to Nazis. Okay. Uh, Heidegger would be associated with Hitler's, uh, with, with, with Nazis, with, with, with the Nazis' rise to power. So Hitler's rise to power uh, would have uh, some kind of an influence in the career of, of Heidegger. Now in that year, aid of Hitler's Nationalist Soci National Socialist German Workers' Party or the NSDAP became the second largest party in Germany, making uh, Hitler one of the uh, most powerful, one of the most powerful uh, political leaders in Germany at the time. And then in 1933, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. So Hitler rose to the highest position in Germany. And Heidegger would become politically involved you know, with, with the Nazis. And uh, he became um, actually became a member or at most a sympathizer of a supporter of the Nazi Nazi party and at that in 1930, 1933 he became or was elected rector of the University of Freiburg you know, by was elected by the faculty and then in May 1933 he joined he the nationalist party the national socialist party of Hitler, okay, he, he joined the Nazi party and he delivered his inaugural uh, rector address uh, entitled The Self-Assertion of the German University. Well, it was a rather ambiguous text, uh, but uh, uh, it was often interpreted as a kind of support or expression of support for Hitler's uh, <clears throat> regime, no, for the Nazi Nazi regime, and as a rector, he produced a number of speeches uh, supporting the Nazi cause, and he placed the great prestige of his scholarly reputation at the service of National Socialism, and thus he became willingly or not uh, a uh, a supporter of the legitimization of the of Nazism of the Nazi party um, <clears throat> among his fellow Germans. Okay, so one of the most uh, controversial 
um, moments or say part of his life, no, both uh, personal and and uh, professional. <clears throat> now, a year later, in April 1934, Heidegger resigned from his office, and he took no further part in politics. His rectoral address was found incompatible with the party, and its text was eventually banned by the Nazis. And certain restrictions were put on his freedom to publish and to attend uh, conferences. So he fell from grace, no? Uh, fell from the uh, graces of the of the party. However, in his lecture courses uh, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and especially in the course entitled Hoderlin's Hymns, uh, Germania and the Rhine, uh, which was originally presented at the University of Freiburg during the winter semester of 1934 to 1935, uh, Hitler, uh, Heidegger expressed covert criticism of Nazism or of the Nazi ideology. Uh, for some time, he was under the surveillance of the Gestapo, the second police of the, of the Nazis. And his final humiliation came in 1944 when he was declared the most expendable member of the faculty. And Heidegger was sent to the Rhine to dig trenches. So he really fell from, you know, from the graces of, of the political, of political, political power. You know? So to further tarnish the reputation after, uh, after Germany's defeat in the Second World War, he was accused of being a Nazi sympathizer. And he was forbidden to teach. And in 1946, he was dismissed from his chair of philosophy. But in 1949, that ban would be lifted. Now, <clears throat> during the last three decades of his life, from the mid-1940s to the mid-1970s, Heidegger was productive in his writings. And uh, he published quite a lot, no? And in his insightful essays and lectures, uh, such as What Are Poets For? Published in 1946. Letter on Humanism, published in 1947. The Question Concerning Technology, 1953. The Way to Language, 1959. Time and Being, 1962. And The End of Philosophy, The Task of Thinking, 1964. He addressed different issues concerning modernity. And Heidegger worked on his original philosophy of history of being. So most of his time was divided between uh, his home in Freiburg and his second sort of second home you know, in Meskets and his mountain uh, hut in the in the in the Black Forest. It's a famous uh, uh, sort of dwelling you know, place for where Heidegger stayed. You know? <laughs> now, in 1966, Heidegger attempted to justify his involvement during Nazi regime in an interview with, uh, the, uh, with the journal Der Spiegel entitled Only God Can Save Us. And one of his uh, last teaching stints or assignment was a seminar on Parmenides that he gave in Saringen in 1973. He remained intellectually active until the very end, until the very end of his life. And before his death, he was actually working on a number of projects, including the massive uh, Yisam Tosgab, um, which is a complete edition of all his, uh, of his work, you know. And Heidegger died uh, in, on May 26, 1976. And he was buried in the churchyards in Mexicans. So that's the uh, the life of, uh, of, Martin he of Martin Heidegger. Uh, rather very colorful, uh, colorful life you know? uh, with, uh, with the highs and the lows, with the ups and the downs. Anyway, now let's go to his philosophical background. Uh, 
philosophy was inspired to philosophy through Brentano's work. Uh, the title of that work is On the Multifarious Meaning of Being According to Aristotle. Uh, Brentano's work, Brentano, Franz Brentano is a very influential uh, philosopher. I don't know why we don't study his philosophy in itself, because Brentano not only um, influenced Heidegger, he actually influenced Husserl also. Uh, the intentionality, the notion of intentionality of, of Husserl uh, came from, from Brentano. No? And even, uh, even Karol Wojtyla acknowledged that one of the philosophers that that uh, that he read uh, early in his uh, uh, philosophical studies is Brentano. No? So Brentano influenced a lot of, of uh, philosophers during the the 19th century. So he's a very important philosopher, I would say. Now, early in his career. Um, Heidegger also encountered, as we have said already, uh, Husserl's logical investigation. And from then, he pursued phenomenology with great interest. And he belonged to a small circle of students and followers of the, of the movement. As we've mentioned, uh, he actually worked with, uh, with Husserl. Uh, he was an associate of Husserl. So Heidegger attended the seminar exercises of, of Husserl, but although he was interested in phenomenology, he already had some differences with, with Husserl. Um, while we have said that Husserl saw in Heidegger an, an heir apparent, you know, somebody who will succeed him in his project, in, in his uh, research in phenomenology, but uh, Heidegger had other things in mind. You know? As I've said, his main interest is not really, well, he's interested in phenomenology, but he's more interested in the meaning or in the philosophy of being. So he would never become Husserl's faithful follower, you know, as uh, Husserl expected him to be. In particular, Heidegger was not captivated by the later developments of Husserl's thought, meaning by his neo-Kantian <clears throat> turn towards transcendental subjectivity, and even less by Husserl's Cartesianism. But nevertheless, um, he, Husserl, uh, Heidegger continued to value the earlier work of Husserl, specifically the logical investigations. And laboring over the questions of things themselves, Heidegger soon become, or began a radical reinterpretation of Husserl's phenomenology. So yes, he studied the initial, the, er, the early ideas of Husserl, uh, which Husserl developed in logical investigation, uh, the epohe, the um, the phenomenological method, etc. But he started to reinterpret Husserl's phenomenological method. For Heidegger. Uh, discussing and absorbing the works of the important philosophers in the history of metaphysics was an indispensable task. And he was very much interested in the pre-Socratic philosophers. Right? Although uh, in his writings, Heidegger would be very critical of these metaphysicians, of these metaphysics, because for Heidegger, they have forgotten the meaning of being. You know? They have changed the narrative of being. So he wanted to go back to what is really the meaning of being. So he went back as far as the pre-Socratics because that's where the question of meaning of, of the meaning of being started. So he 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 was interested in the uh, in the history of metaphysics, in the history of the question of the meaning of being. Right. So that's the the main uh, project, the objective of Heidegger. Husserl, on the other hand, repeatedly stressed the importance of a radical new beginning with few exceptions, like Descartes, Locke, Hume, and Kant. 
and he wished to bracket the history of philosophy. So bracket the history of philosophy so that we can, according to Husserl, uh, establish philosophy on rigorous ground. So he bracketed, meaning as we have discussed in Husserl, wanted to set aside uh, these philosophers so that we can really see uh, to establish a radical beginning for philosophy. Of course, uh, Husserl uh, uh, admired a few philosophers uh, like Descartes, Kant, Jung, and Kant, but wanted to bracket the rest. Heidegger, on the other one, on the other hand, wanted to study all these philosophers. Although eventually, he would be very critical of these philosophers, but this is saying he showed interest in their thoughts. So he studied the history of metaphysics, starting from the pre-Socratics and down the line. <clears throat> okay, now what is this? Um, how did Heidegger reinterpret phenomenology? So this is now Heideggerian phenomenology. Now going back to Husserl, Husserl thought very highly again of Heidegger. And as I've said, he saw in him his most important student that would continue his project. But Heidegger is from, from being his disciple or simply a mouthpiece. Uh, Heidegger has his own ideas. And the phenomenology expressed in the Bingen time was not Husserl, uh, was not as Husserl conceived it to be. So er, in that in that work, in that first major work of Heidegger, he was already developing a, a, a different kind of phenomenology. Okay. And somehow Husserl already uh, got the impression that this is different from the phenomenology that I developed. Uh, there was actually somebody who, who, who said that uh, Husserl rather took offense in using in Heidegger's using his ideas, his own ideas, and then apply those ideas on a different thing. Uh, so he he uh, Heidegger used the ideas of of Husserl. But applied it on a different, you know, a different matter, a different subject. So Heidegger saw in Husserl a renovator in philosophy in the 20th century. But Heidegger was not a disciple, never a disciple. On the contrary, he initiated a revolution in philosophical thinking, which Husserl never expected. And of course, this led, as I already mentioned, this has led to an entrenchment sort of a separation between the two political of uh, uh, two uh, thinkers. Right? Now, in the being in time, you know, <clears throat> a very significant uh, question uh, was asked, and that is the question of the meaning of being. What is being? And this emerged for Heidegger, uh, this question emerged for Heidegger when he read the early on in his uh, studies, he already read Brentano's uh, mol manifold meaning of being, according to Aristotle. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so he already read that this book, and he already he was already questioning, asking the question, what is the meaning of being? What is being? Okay. So Although Brentano's intentions were in part theological, Heidegger found through Brentano his early and en his entry into Husserl's logical investigations. Okay? Because that logical investigation of Husserl will provide him with the method, with approach you know, to deal with the question of the meaning of being. So in his work, Being in Time, <laughs> we have mentioned it was dedicated to, to, to Husserl. And Heidegger uh, acknowledged that he was indebted to the phenomenology of Husserl because that provided him with the right approach, with the methodology to study being. But 
as we have said in this book, phenomenology was described as a methodological concept. Okay, meaning for Heidegger, um, it's uh, it's it can be used as a method, a methodological concept to question the meaning of being. So <clears throat> it was conceived by Heidegger in an original way and resulted from his questioning back to the meaning of the Greek concepts of phenomenon and logos. Phenomenology from phenomenon and from logos. Phenomenon and logos. So what is phenomenon? As Heidegger understood it, phenomenon is that which shows itself from itself. That which shows itself from itself. Meaning, an object that shows itself in the way that it shows itself. It, it could be very complicated, but it simply means that it is something, a phenomenon is something that shows itself, that reveals itself from itself. That's a phenomenon. So when you say phenomenon, normally when you say phenomenon is appearance. So a phenomenon is something that appears to us, that shows itself to us. Okay. So understood together with the concept of logos, it means to let this phenomenon show itself. To let this being show itself, to let this phenomenon show itself in the way that it shows itself from itself. So it's it's a it's a very complicated uh, uh, way of putting it, but that's how he puts it in the beginning time. No? So he said to let that which shows itself be seen from itself in the very way it shows itself from itself. Uh, what is the meaning of that? Let this something reveal or manifest itself in the way it reveals itself. Let it let it reveal. Let it manifest itself. Let it show itself. Let it appear in the way that it appears. In other words, the the subject, the thinker, the person who appreciates this object should not impose. No, should not impose uh, his ideas or his biases. So it's the same as same as when you bracket, you allow this very object to reveal itself. <clears throat> so with that, we can say that a phenomenon is an event that shows itself. An event or something that shows itself. Now, <clears throat> this concept of phenomenology, which uh, re relied much on Aristotle rather than on Husserl, is a radical diversion from Husserl himself. Because although Husserl uh, said that uh, uh, going back to the things themselves, right? We have to go back to the things themselves. But later on, Husserl would say that our, our consciousness somehow constitutes the essence of the thing that we perceive. Meaning, we are no longer letting the event the object or the being to show itself. Okay? We are the, the consciousness is now imposing something, you know, constituting the essence of that event or that being. So that's a different, that's already a different view. Now, <clears throat> so to give an account, meaning to give a logos, to give a study, you know, to give an idea of a phenomena meant for Heidegger to describe beings in their disclosedness. This, this, to disclose is to reveal, right? To show. So to describe being in their disclosedness, focus on how things reveal themselves, how things show themselves to us. Okay, so he calls that disclosedness or sometimes disclosure. No? Uh, <clears throat> 
that would actually be connected to his idea of truth as aletheia, the uncovering. So it's so all interconnected now. So it means to speak and think that one is brought to things in their disclosedness. Just remember to disclose is to uncover, to reveal. No? So full disclosure, for example, no? uh, you disclose your uh, assets and liabilities, your wealth, no, or disclosedness. Now, if you if you hide your assets, your wealth, that's not disclosedness. So, to, so in, in phenomenology, you have to allow the being, the event, the thing to show itself. So to give an account on the shining, you know, to light, to shed light, you know, that allows their manifestness. So disclosedness is an essential character of the lives of individual beings. In other words, for Heidegger, individual beings manifest themselves. They are disclosed to us. Okay? This, this ontological difference between being meaning the occurrence of this closeness and beings, a specific instance of this closeness, is fundamental in Heidegger's thought and persists in several forms throughout his career. So being and beings. What is the meaning of being? For Heidegger, being, he interprets being in, is as to be becoming so being in the sense is disclosing okay or showing and what is being the specific being these are already specific instances of disclosedness no? meaning something has already revealed itself so being can be both the the manifestation or the revelation and at the same time, it could also be the revealed or the manifested. Okay, so th that's the that's how you should under we understand this. No, so Heidegger's way of engaging facticity, uh, history, and time uh, turn him away from consciousness. Okay, uh, towards the world. Why? Because uh, when you say a, a phenomenon is something that is disclosed. When something disclosed is disclosed, we can see that that being is something that is in the world. Okay. Objects are in the world, so they bec that become that become part. The world becomes part of their disclosedness of their manifestation. Okay, so when, when Heidegger talk about facticity, history, time, these are all elements that point to our being in the world. Okay, so little by little, he was no longer he was no longer focusing on consciousness, as Husserl, uh, you know, did, you know, focusing on the nature of consciousness. The unfulfilled directions of beings are not found in a proposed and lively structure of transcendental subjectivity. And that's already the uh, transcendental ego that Husserl was talking about you know, later in his, in his career. So Heidegger have not, uh, does not want to have anything to do with that. No? <clears throat> because for him, uh, the direction of being is the in is in the self-disclosive happening. No? Self-disclosive happening. No? The self-revelation, the self-unconcealment of being in the world. Okay? Being in the world, meaning we, we, we are thrown into the world. Heidegger is famous for that. No? So he moved away from an epistemological orientation of a Surian phenomenology because, excuse me, because the main concern of, of Husserl, as uh, I mentioned in my lecture in Husserl, that 
Husa conceived of phenomenology as a kind of method of epistemology, cosmology, theory of knowledge. How do we know objects? Okay. How do we know the meaning of beings? I mean, how do we know meanings? How do we understand the intensive object of consciousness? Okay. But we have to develop a, a kind of method, the phenomenological method. So the phenomenological method was conceived by Husserl thinking about knowledge, no? epistemology, a theory of knowledge. But uh, for Heidegger, that is not the main point for him. That is not the main point. No? So uh, he turned through a characteristic modern priority given to subjective enactment and, and toward worldly structures that do not originate in human consciousness. In other words, Heidegger was already thinking about what is our subjective, meaning our personal orientation with the world? What is our primary commerce or relation with the world? Is it to know the world or to live in the world? And according to Heidegger, our primary commerce or primary orientation, our primary relation with the world is not really to know it, but to live in it to live, to exist in it. So there's now a, a big difference between, uh, in the direction of Husserl and Heidegger. Now in the beginning time, there's no longer a phenomenological reduction or a transcendental ego. There's no longer the intuition of essence in Husserlian sense. Heidegger's new beginning was at the same time a resumption of the basic question in philosophy. And that is the meaning of being. What is being? And of course, Heidegger would give his own, he would distinguish, you know, make a distinction between being in the active sense, in the to be, and being in the passive sense, being as an entity. So we will, we will, uh, discuss that in data, detail later. Now, so the question about the meaning of being, that's the main priority, the main consideration of, of idea. The question, uh, so his manner of questioning can be described as hermeneutical since it proceeds from an interpretation, an interpretation of being based on the situation of man. Okay. Um, Heidegger did not uh, totally reject uh, the phenomenology of Husserl. Uh, he did not reject the phenomenological standpoint. And this phenomenological standpoint would be interpreted as the first person standpoint. In other words, uh, we have to rely on our own personal experiences, on our lived experiences. That's the phenomenological standpoint, the first person standpoint, our personal standpoint or personal experiences. But he said, it is impossible to suspend our belief, our belief about the world. It is impossible to perform the epohe as Husserl suggested. It is impossible to place ourselves in a realm other than the natural world. Our natural world is part of our experiences. It's part of our living's belt. Therefore, we cannot just bracket ourselves or we cannot suspend ourselves from it because we are, as Heidegger would say, we are Dasein, we are there in the world. So it's impossible to place ourselves outside of this world. Okay. So he said, man is not a detachable consciousness who can abstract himself from the world. As that sign, man is out there. Okay? He is a being in the world. And therefore, it is impossible for man to bracket his own existence. 
or to perform epohe. So if, if you are, for example, in the kitchen, no, it's impossible not to get uh, the, uh, uh, the dirt or the uling. So uh, mahirap, hindi ka pwede maulingan kung naandun ka sa kusina o dun sa kalan. Alright? So that's that's a, a, a Filipino way of, of, of saying, you know, of putting it. So our existence and the existence of the world around us are given together as the starting point of any phenomenological description. In other words, for Heidegger, being in the world is part of our facticity. It's something that we cannot change, something that is already there. We are there in the world. So it becomes the starting point of our phenomenological description. That's our phenomenological standpoint, being there in the world. So the rejection of Epohe led Heidegger to equate the practice of phenomenology to ontology. The meaning, meaning the study of the phenomena and the study of the entities in the world are not separable disciplines. It also led Heidegger to draw conclusions that are against or antithetical to the conclusions of Husserl or to the to Husserl's phenomenological outlook. So Heidegger's notion of the being in the world is an implicit rejection of any form of dualism, the dualism between subject and object. Okay. I'm the subject and there is the object before me. But by placing man in the world, so there is no now, there's no dichotomy now, there's no uh, separation now between me and the object because we are placed together in, in the world. We exist in the world together with all these objects that we know. So Husserl rejected the traditional dualism between consciousness and nature that of distinguishing the objects of consciousness and the objects in themselves, but he fell into another dualism. And that is the dualism between consciousness and its intentional object. It's really impossible to do away with any form of dualism between uh, dualism, subject, object, nowhere known, uh, consciousness and intentional object of consciousness. That's really impossible to have that to, to avoid that kind of dualism. There will always be a, a new kind of dualism that will emerge. You know? But Heidegger, by uh, conceiving of Dasein as a being in the world, uh, somehow avoids this kind of dualism that Heidegger, uh, that Husserl fell into. Okay, So Heidegger, on the other hand, rejected the entire tradition of epistemological dualism that you no know, so object subject nowhere known dualism which started of course you can trace that as far back as aristotle you no know, aristotle aquinas descartes and so on so heidegger demanded all that all philosophy should start with a single concept in that single concept he introduced as being in the world or the dasein which is not separable into consciousness and its object. Because if you find there, find yourself there in the world, then there is no dualism. But if you try to look at it, of course, uh, there is still some form of dualism there because there will always be some kind of a distinction between the Dasein and the other objects that, you know, uh, he deals with, you know, uh, that he has dealings with. But this dualism is not in the uh, in the act of knowing, or it's not based on epistemology, you know? because again, that is not the main uh, agenda of Heidegger. You no, know? his agenda is not uh, epistemological, but rather it's ontological, and you can also say it's existential. You know? Okay. Anyway, so let's go to the next point: hermeneutic facticity. Um, existentialist often uh, makes a distinction between two uh, fundamental 
uh, properties of our existence. And these are facticity and transcendence. What is facticity? Facticity would be, would refer to those uh, aspects of our existence that we cannot change. Okay? That we cannot change. Facticity. So it's already, the, it's permanent. Now, transcendence, on the other hand, is uh, are those uh, things that are uh, defined by us. Meaning, uh, we can change them because uh, uh, we are the ones who brought them into existence. Like, like for example, uh, say, um, our background, our personal background would be part of our facticity. That is something that we can, we can no longer change, you know, what happened in the past. But what we will become, our career, for example, would be part of our transcendence. It will be our own doing. Okay, see, this this two, you know, facticity and transcendence. Now, Heidegger um, defines facticity this way that it's the irreducibility of things in their living events. Okay? The irreducibility of things in their living events, meaning they are already permanent. They are already there. And hermeneutics means interpretative explication hermeneutics means interpretation okay so people recognize and interpret certain things okay, given things before they develop theoretical concepts about them okay they impress so for example before i can have a theoretical concept before i can conceptualize uh what a laptop is for example no? uh, theoretically meaning i can have my own uh, specific and objective description of what is a laptop the first thing i will do is to figure out how i'm going to to use this how i'm going to operate the laptop i may not be able to define what a laptop is at least but i can at least operate it okay <clears throat> so for example um uh, you give somebody say a can opener so he has or say yes a can opener so he has a can and then he cannot open the can and then he you give him a can opener you may not be able to define what a can opener is but because you give him this thing which he can use to open the can then he will figure out how i'm going to use this object which i don't know in the first place to open this can which i'm trying to open okay so we, he will interpret this object in relation to the, the object, the can opener, which he, he or she does not know yet, and relate that to the can he, he, that he's trying to open before he can develop concepts about the can or the can opener. See? Uh, the example that Heidegger uses is, uh, you have the doorknob, there's a door behind me. So before you can figure out what is the meaning, the definition of a doorknob? I'm going to figure out how I'm going to use it. What is this? What is this for? Well, I can, I can figure out that this thing here is used to open the door. All right. So I, I'm using this in order to, to do something, to open the door in, the, in this case. All right. So <clears throat> uh, for Heidegger, that is our primary orientation with the world. Or she said primary commerce with the world to live in it to use the objects that we see not necessarily to know them or to define them because later on we will know what they are we will be able to give definition or meaning to what they are but for Heidegger that would be secondary <clears throat> that is not the primary all right so interpretations arise as people live practically with things, as they encounter them in different contexts, when they use them, when they feel their impacts, okay? So, excuse me. So, uh, prior to the distance evoked or invoked by theoretical reflection, oh, there's already the dualism, right? Uh, I am the knower and the cut, the cut opener or the doorknob is an object that is 
uh, in front of me. So I have to maintain some kind of a distance, right? <clears throat> a distinction between the knower and the known. But he said, prior to this distance, people are enmeshed in their environments. Meaning they are there in their environment and they use these, these objects. They, they, they don't see that as something that is separated from them. So people's environments are filled with things that appear in their living, usually practical in their living, usually, usually practical specificity. Yeah, meaning the objects have specific uh, uses, specific functions, and so on and so forth. So Heidegger came to the idea of hermeneutics of facticity, that is, interpretation based on practical life. <clears throat> so if hermeneutics is interpretation, okay, the hermeneutics of facticity means my interpretation based on practical life. And of course, this, this interpretation based on practice, based on practicality, is found in the works of Aristotle. Okay, it's found in the work of Aristotle, and of course, this interpretation also is. You can also find that in in Husserl. But you see here that Heidegger is now trying to combine uh, the ideas, the notions of Aristotle and Husserl. Now, let's go to the main ideas of Heidegger: being and Dasein. <clears throat> so. Central to his first major work, Being in Time, is the analysis of the meaning of Dasein. And this analysis of the meaning of Dasein is called by Heidegger as fundamental ontology. Fundamental ontology. And the central problem of fundamental ontology is the meaning of being. Okay? What is being? So try to trace the meaning of being way back to the pre-Socratics. Okay? Because the pre-Socratics, uh, Thales, Maxagoras, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Maximenes, Anaximander, Democritus, etc. They were the first to ask the meaning of being. Okay? Then, of course, you have uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then the uh, the uh, patristic philosophers like Augustine asking about the meaning of being, the scholastics like Aquinas questioning the meaning of being, and then the rationalists questioning about the meaning of being. So, it's philosophy is so much uh, a concern with the meaning of being. What is the meaning of being? So Heidegger sort of joined the joined the fray and also asked the question: What is the meaning of being? However, before for Heidegger, before we can question the meaning of being, for Heidegger, we have to inquire first about the questioner, the inquirer. And this inquirer or the inquirer is the Dasein. So before we can ask about the meaning of being, let's ask about who is this questioner? Who is this being who can ask the question about the meaning of being? So the discussion in on the question of being begins with an analysis of the inquirer, of the one who is capable of asking and, of course, answering the question about the meaning of being. Okay? And because of this capacity or capability to ask the question, this questioner and inquirer occupies a privileged position in regards to all other beings. So you have all you have beings all over. There's one particular being who can ask the meaning of being. So he is in a privileged position because he can ask what is the what is be, the being of these beings? And what is my own being? And that is the, the sign. And Heidegger answered that question about the inquirer, about the dasein, sign in the in the being in time. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so, this being is called Dasein. And by conceiving Dasein as being in the world, Heidegger made the ancient problem concerning the relationship and duality between subject and object rather superfluous. It is no longer, it is 
no longer relevant. It becomes irrelevant, right? So the basic structures of Dasein are, and this is, he enumerates and discusses in the beginning time, primordial moodness, understanding, and speech. And well, of course, there are other uh, features of this Dasein, but these are the more fundamental ones. And they are founded on the temporalization of the Dasein. And what is this temporalization Dasein? It simply means that we understand Dasein to be temporal, meaning the Dasein is in time. Okay? So, being in time is the title of the book. That actually, you can translate that in something like this. Being means to be and time. So, to be is to be in time. Okay? To be a being is to be in time. To be is to be temporal. So that's the temporalization of that sign. It simply means it emphasizes that the that sign is not just a being in the world, but the that sign is temporal. It is in time. Okay? So <clears throat> the two basic possibilities of man's existing are those in which the that sign either comes to itself, meaning now that when 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 the when the dust sign looks into him, into himself, then he comes to itself, meaning he becomes honest, he 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 realizes himself, and therefore he attains authenticity. Or the dust sign loses itself, Men, meaning it forgets itself, does not understand itself, and therefore it becomes inauthentic. So when the dust sign understands itself. It attains authenticity when it loses itself, when it forgets itself, then it becomes inauthentic. So that side is inauthentic when it lets the possibilities of choice for its own existence be given by others instead of deciding for itself. So when the that side recognizes itself, actualizes itself. <coughs> makes its own choices, all right, actualizes its own possibilities, then it becomes authentic. But when it lets others to decide for itself, when it lets others to, you know, um, allow others to dictate on himself or to, to dictate on the dash sign, then it attains, or it does not attain authenticity, rather it becomes inauthentic. Okay. But let's go deeper into the question. Why the Das sign? Why does Das sign has a priority over the other entities? Okay. Because <clears throat> Heidegger makes a distinction between the Das sign and the other entities. What are these other entities? The other entities would be the physical objects, the other beings that are material, physical. Uh, Sartre would call them the in itself. Okay, they are they they, they don't have consciousness. The dust sign has consciousness. Okay, uh, this this uh, mouse is an entity or a scientist, okay? A scientist, it's an entity. It, I, I will use this, okay? It's already finished, I mean, meaning it does not have consciousness. It does not know what it really is. Only me as a Dasein can understand what this, what is this for, all right? So, uh, <clears throat> the Dasein, the is able to have, cons uh, is able to understand not only its own being, but the being of the other entities. All right. So, uh, so Heidegger asked, you asked the question, why does the dark sign take priority? Because it's ontical priority. Okay, ontica, um, just a distinction. 
when uh, Heidegger used the word ontical, it means ontical. The, the ontical would be the, the physical things. But to distinguish it from the ontological, the ontological would be the, the metaphysical. Okay. So ontical priority, it, I, for example, I am in this room, all right? I am together with other objects in this room. Okay, so this room will be ontical because these are all physical material objects. I am also physical. Okay, in the sense, I am also physical, I have a body, right? So, ontical priority, but why does it, ha why do I have priority over all these other objects in my room? Well, first, because one, it is only the entity in the ontical level, meaning in the physical level, which has existence ontologically. Oh, that's a, it's a, that's a tough one. Existence ontologically. Now, let us explain what we mean by existence. Existence from the word exist, and Heidegger interprets exist as to stand out. To stand out. What do you mean by standing out? standing out <clears throat> meaning i can sort of get out of myself okay i can get out of my not physically getting out of oneself in other words i can take a look at myself no i can stand out of myself ontologically meaning i can have how do i put that I can look at myself from a distance, okay? Like, like for example, when you do critical, like when you have self-reflection, it is as if the self gets out of itself and look into itself, right? So that's, the, that's so existence means to stand out. So the Dasein is the only entity that can stand out of itself and look into itself. <clears throat> um, be this this mouse cannot get out of itself and look into itself. It does not have any consciousness in the first place. Second, that the Dasein can achieve an understanding of its ontological structures, meaning it can achieve self-understanding. I can attain self-understanding. I can understand myself. Man can understand himself. That's the reason, it's the very basis of self-reflection, right? We can understand ourselves. We are aware of ourselves. This cannot have self-understanding. It will never understand what the, the mouse will never understand what it is for. Only me as a Dasein can understand what is this mouse for. And not only this mouse for, but what I am for. Like what I am for, for the society or for my family, or even for myself. Third, it can achieve an ontological understanding of all other entities, of all ontic structures of other entities. Meaning, I cannot just understand myself, I can also understand what is this for. All right, so that's the third one. Now, the ability to have such an attitude towards the self, or towards oneself, understand oneself in regards to the possibilities of one's own being is a distinctive mark of an entity characterized by existence, characterized by this ability to stand out. So existence is exclusive to man. Only man can stand out of itself and look into itself. Only man can stand out and then see what are these objects for, okay? So this idea points to a fundamental ontology which offers an analysis of the mode of being of the inquirer and its basic structures. So that's the Dasein as the inquirer. That's why it has a priority over other entities. Although we cannot grasp being, we can see the distinction between Dasein and other entities or other objects or other beings. Okay, so the Dasein is not just any other being, okay? Because it's the only being that can understand itself. So the Dasein is distinguished 
from all other entities by the fact that he builds up a certain relationship with himself. No? Because a cognitive relation with himself. He can know himself. And not only that, certain relationship with other objects. So to understand, uh, to, to understand the Dasein, we have to bring to light the existentialia, meaning the basic structural determinations of the Dasein, of man. Okay? These are the basic structures, the essential properties, so to speak, of man or of the Dasein. And according to Heidegger, these are the Finlitzkeit, uh, translated as disposition or state of mind or the state in which the Dasein finds itself, Verstehen or understanding, and Berfallen or fallenness or forfeiture. We're going to discuss them one by one. Okay, So the existentialia are distinguished from the categorical determination of non-human entities. Huh? So, of course, uh, in Aristotle talks of the categories of being, right? Uh, and even Kant talks of the categories, but the existentialia is different. It's a category, uh, the, is, the existentials are different from the categories, no? Because these categories define non human entities. <clears throat> now, the meaning of that sign is a task imposed on him is committed as a task that to be so let's interpret now being of that sign uh, the being of that sign is not to be fixed the being of that sign is not something fixed it is not something permanent okay it's not an ensoi the that sign is a porsoi it has consciousness and therefore it can become Okay, remember transcendence. There are things that are part of our facticity we cannot change, but there are also things that we determine. Okay, our being, our becoming will be determined by us. So that determination, the possibilities or the actuality of these possibilities is a task for us okay so for heidegger the being of the sign is not simply is meaning our being man is not finished it's not is it must be realized it must be accomplished we have to be no? uh, this one is 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 meaning it has, this has already been defined what it will be this mouse but me as a person we cannot say mr x is this because mr s can become right <clears throat> tomorrow even later we'll be a different person we become a different person so the doesn't is to be okay so in the beginning time Heidegger begins with two general statements. He said, the mode of being of its Dasein is a question of its own being. And therefore, it is my ownness. My ownness is a character of the Dasein. No? Meaning, my own becoming. And second, that the essence of Dasein lies in its existence. Meaning, lies in its future-oriented sense, how we will become. So the distinctive character of the Dasein lies in its specific mode of being. And this specific mode of being okay, lies in the fact that it can choose itself. The Dasein can choose what it will become. So this choice is the basis of its authenticity or inauthenticity. Meaning, if the Dasein decides for itself 
owns its own choices and determines itself, actualizes its own potentialities, then it attains authenticity. Otherwise, it becomes inauthentic. So when the Dasein lets the choice be pre-given to it, be determined by other people, be dictated by others, then it becomes inauthentic. Okay? All right, now, let's move now to the meaning of being as Dasein in the world. Because this is one of the general structures of the Dasein. So being in the world. Okay, what does it mean? So it means that the Dasein exists in an empirical, ontic level of average everydayness. Wow, that's uh, rather very, very complicated. All right, <clears throat> Let, let's <clears throat> let's digest that uh, part by part. Average everydayness. When you say average everydayness in our daily activities, in our day-to-day -day activities, okay. Uh, what do you mean by empirical ontic level? Well, empirical would be experiential level. Meaning, what we do normally in in the course of a day, for example, what do we do? We we rise up in the we wake up in the morning. We rise up. We wash up. Then we eat. Uh, of course, we eat. We have the food, and then uh, we do our things. We go to work. We study. Of course, in the course of our uh, coursework, in the course of our, you know, in the course of the day, we use certain objects, gadgets, cell phone, etc., uh, etc. Et so that's that's the empirical ontic level, right? That's the average everydayness of the Dasein, the day-to-day -day existence of Dasein. So this average everydayness, according to Heidegger, forms the starting point for the interpretation of Dasein. How do we understand Dasein? Well, you have to understand Dasein in day-to-day -day experiences, day-to-day -day activities, average everydayness. Okay? So the fundamental structure of this ontic level is being in the world or to be in the world. Meaning, we, we, in our in our day-to-day -day activities, daily activities, we are in a world, right? Uh, so we do not dichotomize this. We do not. We, well, we can compartmentalize our world, but to be in a world is is a unitary phenomenon, according to according to Heidegger. That is the first <clears throat> existential. But he said this should be analyzed ontologically, not ontically. What is the meaning of that? What is <clears throat> What is to be analyzed ontologically? Meaning, yes, we are living in our, you know, day-to-day -day activities. We are dealing with these different objects in front of us. Uh, ball pen, laptop, cell phone, books, whatever. But we have to go deeper. We have to under understand their being. Ontology. So, to be or being in the ontological sense is the a priori ability to have things that we relate to, to care about and concern ourselves with. Okay? To, so, to be in is not just to be, well, that I have laptop in front of me, that I have, you know, table in front of me, that I have other things in front of me. Those things would be on the ontological level, but take a look, take a deeper look at these objects. What are they for? All right. So the meaning of to be in something is not necessarily to be contained, that my laptop is in front of me, that I have this table, etc., etc. It is more of being familiar with. It means that the Dasein is always outside, dwelling alongside with other entities. In other words, yes, that the this laptop 
<clears throat> maybe in front of me, but if I am not familiar with a the laptop, then I will not be able to use this laptop. So as a teacher, my books will always be my books, the laptop, cell phone, ball pen, whatever. Uh, things that you use in, in teaching will be alongside you. They will always be within your reach, but you are familiar with them. Because in my world as a teacher, suppose somebody gives me a stethoscope and my stethoscope, that stethoscope is in front of me, but it's not really part of my world. I am not familiar with that, right? So a doctor would be familiar with, or a, a scientist, uh, or a nurse rather, a doctor would be familiar with those, uh, with, with a stethoscope, for example, all right? Or say, uh, if somebody gives me a microscope here, it will be beside me, but I will not be familiar with it because it's not part of my world. So to be in is to be familiar with things that, you know, um, you use and you are concerned with them. You care for them. Care not in the sense that, you know, it, they matter to you because you use them. Okay. So this is the primary mode of the Dasein being in the world. To be familiar with objects that he use. Okay to have, to care for these objects, for these entities. So that's being in, but what do you mean by in? To be contained? No. In the ontological sense, it is that makes possible the feeling of familiarity. It is the one that makes uh, the world our home. We become familiar with the objects. No? So he said, when Dasein directs itself towards something and grasps it, it does not somehow first get out of an inner sphere in which it has been formally or proximally encapsulated, but its primary kind of being is such that it is always outside, alongside with entities, which it encounters in which belong to a world already discovered. The Dasein which knows remains outside and it does so as Dasein. So meaning to be in the world is to be with other entities, to be with other objects, but these other entities are familiar to us. Why are they familiar to us? because they are part of our world, okay? C consider this, for example, if you are a musician, what would be your world? Your world will be composed of musical instruments, equipments. So in the, in the studio, you are alongside what? different kinds of musical instruments and equipments and you are familiar with them. That's part of your world. That's the world of a musician. Suppose somebody puts their, puts in the, in the studio, uh, like, uh, what? A ball, a basketball. Unless the musician knows basketball, that basketball will not be part of his world. And he will not be familiar with, with that. It's not part of his world. Okay. So, to, so the Dasein is in the world because he's familiar with these objects in the world. Okay. Now, speciality of being in the world. Speciality is not an occurrence at a position in world space, meaning that my laptop occupies a particular space, you know, in this, on this table. But speciality is generated by the way Dasein sees things 
as far or close. It shows its character in the disseverance and directionality. Okay. Meaning, <clears throat> disseverance is an existential that makes farness banished. So, my laptop being near to me is not determined by how close it is to me. Okay. But how I how I can encounter this laptop. How I direct my attention to the laptop. If somebody brings me here in my room, say uh, I what? Say again, let's use microscope. Maybe I will take a look at it. I will be I will be surprised why is this object here. But I will all I will not focus my attention to it. I would rather focus my attention on this laptop on the book. That defines the speciality of uh, of the world <clears throat> now let's take a look at the world what is this world that we have been talking about what is the world in the first place and what is how does heidegger define or explain the world first heidegger gives a via negativa characterization of the world what the world is not in 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 his in his uh, in his phenomenology as he explained the dasein the world does not denote a way of characterizing entities neither the interpretation of their being he said neither the ontological ontological depiction of entities within the world nor the ontological interpretation of the being as such to reach the phenomenon of the world. So, the world for Heidegger is an ontological concept. Okay. Well, of course, we can look at the world in the ontical sense, meaning in the physical sense. Right? The world is made of physical structures, buildings, houses, roads, bridges whatever ontical physical material but because we're talking of the world in that sign he defined it existentially but existentially how what is the meaning of the world for the existence of that sign okay. and there are four possible senses of the world here. First, the world as an ontical concept. No, I, I said the world can be composed of the physical objects, the, of the physical entities. Okay. And of course, if these physical entities have something to do with me, related to me, then they will become part of my world. Definitely our cell phones are part of our world. You as students, your books will be part of your world. Okay. Your laptop and gadget will be part of your world. Your pen will be part of your world. Those are entities. Okay. So that that's the world as the totality of entities. The second sense of the world is the world as an ontical concept, but in relation to the being of these entities what are these entities for so i have a ball pen i have a laptop i have a mouse i have books what are they for they're part of my world because i use them for teaching i use them for studying consider the musician the musician would have musical instruments equipments etc etc but these entities are, are not just entities. They are part of his world because they, the, the musician used them for making music. 
for composing, you know, <clears throat> for recording, etc. And then you have the world in the pre-ontological existence, the connectedness of the world and the Dasein. But these entities are part of my world. Musical instruments and equipments are part of the world of the musician. That these entities, this laptop, the books, mouse, etc., part of the world of a teacher. And then, of course, the last one, the ontological existential concept of the world. What is the world itself? Okay. The totality of these objects. So the world as an ontological concept would be that's where the world, or that's where the Dasein is thrown into. Okay. So the point of departure of covering the world with the world it's the world which is closest to us. So I mentioned about, for example, if you're a student, you have your gadgets, you have your laptop, you have your books, you have your notebook, ball pen, etc., etc. That is the world that is closest to you. That's the environment. That's the umwelt. The world that is closest to you is your umwelt. So in our everyday average everydayness, in our daily life, it is in our environment that we are caught up in our concerns and activities. That's 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 the environment. That's your umwelt. And within this environment, within this world, within this surrounding world, we encounter entities that are closest to us, the things that we use. So this laptop, this ball pen, this mouse, this book, they are like utensils. We use them. They are part of our world. So the musical instruments, the musical equipment, all right, and maybe the other applications will be part of the world, of the environment, of the umwelt, of the musician. As philosophers, part of our world would be not just the, the gadgets, no? but what is contained there. The lectures, the handouts, the recordings, the good discussions, etc. So the being of entities in the world are phenomenologically exhibited through our dealings in and dealing with of these entities. We deal with them. We deal in them. We encounter them as tools. They are pragma. Okay. They are they are practical for us. They're equipments. We use them in order to do this. The musical instruments, the musical equipments, the applications, etc., are used by the musician in order to create music. We use our books, our laptops, we use the lectures, the recordings in order to write something, say, write a thesis or a proposal, in order to. Now, according to Heidegger, this dealing with these entities is not perceptual cognition, but manipulation, using. We use them. Of course, later on, we will know what they are, but the first relation, orientation with them is to use them. So we cannot view utensils, tools, equipments, books, etc. in purely theoretical sense or theoretical mode. We understand them not by observation, not by speculation, but in the course of handling them, in the course of using them. So the worldhood of the world enables the Dasein to experience utensils, equipments, like these entities rather, like tools, 
like with movements, like the tenses. Okay? Their instructors are defined as readiness at hand and presence at hand. They're always there, ready to be used. They're always present to be used. Okay? All right. So, uh, let's go to the next point. Dasein as being with. The Dasein does not only exist with entities. The Dasein is not an isolated self or isolated ego. The world of Dasein is also a world with. To be in is also to be with. That means to be with others. So this is another existential characteristic of the Dasein. It's not just that the world that the Dasein is being in the world, that he's also being with other Dasein. The Dasein is also a mid sign, a being with other Dasein. The world is also indicative of others. We encounter other Daseins in the world. Okay? So, the kind of being which belongs to the Dasein of others, as we encounter it within the world, differs from the equipments, from the tools, utensils that uh, we use. Okay? So, they, they differ from readiness at hand and presence at hand. The other Daseins are being there too. Okay? So, others, we do not mean that uh, they are different from us. They are also the same as us. Okay? So, we do not distinguish ourselves from others because they are also Dasein. They are being there too, according to Heidegger. Okay? Not being ready or present at hand, but being there too, meaning they are also Dasein just like us. Okay? All right. Now, let's go to this, uh, the meaning of being in as such. Now, let's uh, go deeper into this concept of Heidegger. Being in is that constitutive moment of being which exhibits the being of Dasein directly. All right. That's rather difficult to. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a very difficult thing. It's very difficult to understand. All right. Anyway, so let's let's put this put it this way. Uh, what does it mean to be to be in? Okay. Uh, because when we say da sign, uh, we say da sign. Uh, to uh, the 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 sign there is to be, right? And da means uh, there, da sign, to be there or being there. So there being, actually, if you don't want to, to, to uh, uh, translate it literally. So being, because da sign is essentially being in, there can be something like being in the world. That's uh, how Heidegger puts it. He said, the entity which is essentially constitutive by being in the world is itself its very case, it's there. Now, again, a very difficult thing to, to interpret. So again, I mentioned there, the da points to da signs there. Da sign is itself, it's there, being there. But again, what is the meaning of being there. Huh? What, is, what is the meaning of being there? The there emphasizes the character of Dasein of not being closed off, of being open, of being disclosed, of being uncovered. Remember uh, disclosure. Uh, if you go back to, our, to what we said about phenomenology is to let something reveal itself to show itself. So when something is there, then 
it is not something that is covered. It is it is something that is open, disclosed. No? Uh, in Bicol, uh, there we have the term yaon. Yaon. I actually wrote a paper on yaon. No? My classmate Father Tria also wrote something about yaon. No? So to be there is to be open. To be revealed, to be disclosed. Okay. So Heidegger said this entity carries in its own, in its own most being, the character of not being closed off. In the expression there, we have in view this essential disclosedness. By reason of this disclosedness, this entity or the Dasein. Together with being there of the world is there for itself. So to be disclosed, to be open, to be to be uncovered. The there the emphasize. Sorry. So there are three primary moments of being or the Dasein's disclosedness. So this is now the three fundamental existential. So if if the Dasein is there in the world, what is Dasein's being there in the world mean? What does it mean to be there? What does it mean to be to be uncovered, to be open, to be disclosed, to be unconcealed? What does it mean? Heidegger said there are three primary moments of this of this disclosure, of this being open. Namely, befitted Skype, Verstehen, and Verfallen. So we'll discuss this uh, one by one. First, Befinlet Skype. Uh, in the translation of, I'm using the old translation of Macquarie and Robinson. Huh? Uh, he tra they translated it as the state of mind. However, uh, Gelben, uh, a commentator of Heidegger, stressed that the term is more akin to the phrase, the state in which one is to be found. So the state in which something is to be found, or one is to be found. So, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> if if you visit your friend in 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 his place or in his house, and then you knock at the door, and then uh, he opens the door. So you will see him. You will see your friend in the state in which he is to be found. So if he is wearing this uh, this shirt, then that the state you are going to find him. If you visit a sick friend and he is in the hospital, moment you enter the room, you see him or her in the hospital bed in that particular state. Okay, so the Finland Skype is the state in which we find the Dasein being in the world. Right? And Gelben enumerated the purposes of Heidegger for analyzing the Finland sky. So <clears throat> he said, first, the analysis of the state of mind or the state of being found no? or the state in which one is to be found is aimed at showing that when the Dasein becomes aware of itself in the world, it always does so to some extent influence by the unalterability of facts. That no Dasein, no man relates to the world without at least some awareness of the unavoidable influences of the way the world is. But when the, the world, when you find Dasein in the world, you will find the Dasein to be surrounded by things that, well, he cannot, the world, the world that he finds himself in contains things that he cannot just avoid, that he cannot change. So the Dasein is aware that there are things in the world that he can no longer change. Well, he can, he will know some of those that can, can be changed, can be altered, but he becomes aware that <clears throat> these are, these, these things are part of the facticity. 
Okay? A second, that the befriendless kind of st the state of mind becomes an all-important factor, even in such seemingly tranquil moments of human existence. Huh? For example, uh, you may be enjoying uh, yourself while, you know, relaxing. Uh, for example, you are in a beach and you are relaxing, you can feel the breeze, no? the cool air. Okay? So even in those moments, tranquil moments, you will realize that there are things that you cannot change. No? That, that they are part of, of, of the world. That, that, like, like for example, uh, if you are in the beach, you will always see the sound of the waves, right? That's that's. Or if, if you are in the city, uh, even when you are in the comforts of your car, you will, well, you see the traffic all around. Okay, that's the state where the Dasein who lives in the metro find themselves in. Third, that the Dasein's awareness of actual existence is due to Dasein's state of mind. No? My awareness of my existence is because of how I find myself in the world. And number four, that the village guide or state of mind or the state in which one is to be found is the basis for the world mattering to Dasein. What do you mean by the world that the world matters to us? This is this present state where we find ourselves matters to us, matters to that sign. It's important to us. Okay. So Heidegger means by the term the a priori existential by means by which that sign has its moods. It means that the Dasein finds itself in such in such a way. That the Dasein finds itself in a world without being asked to be in it. So the world, we find the world to be like this. And we were not asked if we want to be part of this world. We are just thrown there. Okay. We were not asked before we were born if we want to be born in this very chaotic world. But we find ourselves here. And it matters to us to be here. Okay. So the state of mind is the mode of awareness of the actual. What really is the world? What is the actual world that we are in? It discloses the actual state of the Dasein in the world. However, to be disclosed does not mean to be known as such and such this thing, but rather it discloses or reveals the fact that the Dasein is in the world. And therefore, this state of mind discloses Dasein's actuality. It, it, it reveals how we are in the world. The actuality of this world. <clears throat> the state of mind is the ontological existential structure and the ontical manifestation of this is mood. Ontical meaning, again, in the practical side, how do we experience this state of mind? How do we experience this actuality? We experience this actuality through our moods and mood for, uh, as uh, Heidegger explained it, is our attunement to the world. We are attuned to the world. So we, we are, well, because we are already there, our mood will be, will have to, our mood should be that we are attuned no, to the world. So, the mood reveals my state as it is in its throneness. It emphasizes the unchangeable, 
the actual. It discloses how one is, uh, how we are faring, how we are. No? It the mood reveals to the da, how the Dasein deals or comports himself with his actual state, with his actuality, with his facticity. Okay, so for example, we find our if if we live, for example, uh, in a in a in a local area in, in the province, for example, and uh, this is how things are in the province, for example. It will it reveals our state. No, like for example, as uh, <clears throat> here in the city. It likes we are always in a hurry, right? It, it 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 feels like time is always racing, and we have to be attuned to it, right? That's how life is in the city. You go home or you go to the province; it's a different thing. It's a different state. Uh, time is rather slow okay you are not always in a hurry you take you know uh you are you feel comfortable no traffic see no pollution so it's a different state it's a different actuality so a different so you have different moods you have different attunements so to speak okay. now Fear provides an example of how a state of mind reveals the actual mode of the Dasein. Fear. It is the one, it is one of the ways in which the Dasein relates to the givenness of its world. It is an important revelation how significant the world is to Dasein, or how the world matters to Dasein. That the world matters to Dasein. Why, why are we afraid? Why do we feel fear well if, if things do not matter to you why be afraid we, we are afraid because things matter to us so fearing is possible because our existence that it uh, my our existence determined by a concern for what is or actual okay. so the moods, you know, the attunement, our fears reveal how the world matter to us. How the actual, you know, matters to us. Now the second is verse 10. Verse 10 is translated as understanding. If the Finless Sky tells us about our actuality, how we are, you know, how we are faring in the world, how things are in the world. Verse 10 reveals to us our possibilities. So if the Finland sky tells us the factual, the actual, actual state of fear, Verse reveals to us our possibilities. What can be, what we can do, what we can become. Now, the analysis of verse 10 is, the, is important for three reasons. Number one, it provides us an account within the existential analytic of how that sign is aware of its possibilities. Meaning, if the befellow sky tells us or makes us aware of our actualities, the verse 10 tells us makes us aware of our possibilities. Number two, it provides a basis for Heidegger's theory of interpretation. How we interpret. Because our understanding would be based, our interpretation rather, would be based on how we understand. And it provides basis for Heidegger's theory of freedom. Again, understanding is an existential as an existential is a priori. 
and reveals the manner in which the sign exists, just like we feel with sky. It should not be interpreted only in terms of the mind's cognitive activities. No, sometimes when you talk of understanding, you always think of cognition. No, so to understand is to cognize or to know. But for Heidegger, understanding reveals to Dasein first its existence structure. The, the structure of its own existence. Okay? How we exist. And then later on, it will reveal to us how we can know our existence in the world. No, but the question is, how does understanding or Verstehen reveal to Dasein its mode of existence? It reveals to Dasein its mode of existence by making Dasein able to be. It makes Dasein become. <clears throat> it helps Dasein to understand its possibilities. So through understanding, the Dasein becomes aware of his potentiality for being. In other words, his potentiality to be, to be somebody. So if the Finland sky tells us what we are, how we are doing, Verstehen tells us how we can become. Our possibilities to be somebody. So Dasein's existence is a possibility stretching out before us, before before the Dasein. So when so when you when you look at the world, you you, you feel that this is the actual, right? This is the world. This is the, the state I find myself in. But on the other hand, when we look out, we don't just see the actual. We don't just see the the actual state of things, we can actually project ourselves to the future, to what we can become. Right now, I am a student. This is my state of mind, right? I, I find myself to be a student, but I also realize, wait a minute, I'm not just a student. I may be a student now, but I can be somebody. I can be a professor. I can be a lawyer. I can be a professional. That's what Verstehen does to the Dasein. It reveals to the Dasein the possibilities stretching out before him. So this potentiality to be something, to be somebody, is part of Dasein's mode of existence. So if the state of mind or the Philip sky is the mode of existence, that reveals to the Dasein its facticity in the mode through which the Dasein is aware of its givenness in the world and its thrownness. Understanding, on the other hand, is the mode of existence that reveals to the Dasein, to us, its existence and through which the Dasein becomes aware of its possibilities. It makes Dasein aware of what could happen, what he can become. Okay. So, one function of understanding is projection. This is a feature of understanding, projection. What is projection? When we understand, we understand something we understand ourselves, we understand anything, then we can make projection. To, to project, to project is not to, to, to make something, you know? Projection is to throw, okay? To throw before us. To so to project is, uh, uh, like, for example, if, if you have an arrow and you project the arrow, then the, the arrow throws itself, right? The projection is throwing out these possibilities. So it's like, it's like jumping 
to, towards the future. No? Jumping towards your possibilities. So what is projected, what is thrown out, no, thrown out before you, is the whole range of your possibilities. No? So it's like being open. So to understand, it's not just to know, but to, to, to understand is to project out. Oh, so this is, these are my possibilities. This, this how I can become. This is the person I can be. So I have to project myself, not to throw myself into those possibilities. That's actually connected to freedom. Freedom is, that projection of, you know, I can be this, I can be that. Nobody can hold me up. Nobody can tell me I have to be this. I, as a Dasein, I understand my possibilities and I will project myself. I will throw out myself to those possibilities. Now, another function of understanding is interpretation. Okay. And Interpretation for Heidegger is the function of understanding that makes explicit what Dasein is simply because it exists. What does it mean? To in, so to, to interpret is not really, is, is not to come up with something new. All right. To, to interpret is to make explicit what is already there. Okay, so if through projection, understanding functions by projecting the possibilities, interpretation is the working out of this projection. So, so these are my possibilities. I can be somebody. And I have to throw out myself to those possibilities. So how am I going to work out? Ah, I will do this like this and like that as this, for this, etc. So, interpretation is the working out of this projection. If, for example, I will be a lawyer, so what, how do I work out the possibilities? So, that's the meaning of interpretation, the working out of these possibilities of this projection. So, the function of interpretation as working out of possibilities is to make explicit Explicit what is already within the range of human awareness. You're aware of the possibilities. So how do you how do you work this out? So Heidegger here focuses on the ability you know, of the mind to make explicit and to reveal what is somehow already within one's experience. So it's not to interpret is not to invent something new, but to make explicit what is already there. All right, number three. Where is where fallen? What is where fallen? Fallenness. Sometimes you call this forgetfulness. If the Dasein is aware of its potentialities, or first, if the Dasein is aware of its actuality of its facticity and the Dasein is also aware of its potentialities or possibilities. The Dasein can also forget you know, it can also forfeit those possibilities. If the Dasein is aware of the importance of becoming, of freedom, of projection, it can also forget, it can also fall into forgetfulness. So where fallen is the non-awareness of the significance of what it means to be. When the da sign is lost in the sort of lost in the crowd. Okay. When the Dasein forgets its possibilities, 
And this is manifested, this non-awareness, this verfallen, this forfeiture or forgetfulness manifested in idle talk. Idle talk, chismis. <laughs> in curiosity. No? Ososero, ososera. Mga meron. <laughs> and then ambiguity. Okay? Ambiguity, confusion, falsehood, fake news. See? So these are all manifestations of their fallen or fallenness. And there's so much their fallen. No? Fallenness means us nowadays. Fake news. Right? Mis, mis and disinformation. These are all manifestations of their fallen. Now, as I've said, so that's the meaning of to be. Okay? To be that the Dasein being there, that the Dasein has these existentials. When it's like verse 10 and fallen. But we also said that. Dasein is not just being there. To be there is to be temporal. To be in time. And Heidegger talks of the different modes of temporalization, of being temporal in relation to the different structures. No? This, uh, uh, in relation to being authentic or non-authentic. Medyo hindi naka-align yung aking, ano, yung aking presentation because I, I increased the, the size of the font. But you divide this into two, authentic, inauthentic. And there are three uh, modes of temporalization. All right? The future, the present, the past. Okay? Or we can say the present or the past, the present, the future. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So, with regards to the future, what should be our attitude, authentic attitude? Now, in terms of projecting towards the future, we anticipate. We anticipate the future. That's the authentic mode of temporalization, anticipation. And when we anticipate, we, we prepare for the future. The authentic mode, in authentic mode, is awaiting. So you lie idle there and just wait for the future to come. Like you just wait for the exam to come. You just wait for the deadline to come. But if you anticipate, you you read you you prepare. Like for example, in our case in the Philippines, because calamities happen always. So what do you do? You anticipate. You prepare for the coming of the typhoon. Okay, or you anticipate the exam, you prepare for the exam. In authentic, you await, lie idle, and just wait for things to happen. In the present, what would be the authentic mode? Okay, in the present. Well, what do we do in the present? moment okay see authentic <clears throat> we I, I, I am reminded of carpe diem seize the moment seize the present seize the day right so you you don't just you, you seize the what is what is here, no? Seize the moment. The inauthentic is presentation. Things happening, so you just let things, you know, flow. No? Like what happens in uh, the Miron. <laughs> you know, curiosity. 
you're not taking any action. Like idle there. Okay. And then the past. What this authentic mode? Repetition. By repetition, it's not it's not repeating. It's not repeating the past. It's it's more of remembering the past so that we can learn from the past. All right. The inauthentic is oblivion. Oblivion is forgetting the past. And that's what's happening right now in, in our country. Oblivion of history. The forgetting of history. We don't remember our history anymore. That's why we keep repeating our mistakes. Mistakes that we did in the past. Past authentic is repetition or remembering so that we learn from the past, from our mistakes, that we don't commit the same mistakes again. And God forbid we make the same mistake again. So let's not for let let's avoid oblivion, oblivion of being, oblivion of history, forgetting our history. Now, next point: care as the being of the sign. Okay, what is the meaning of care? Again, we go back to the average everydayness, now, our daily life as the sign. It's a, it's a rather long formulation of Heidegger. It said, being in the world which is falling, fallenness, and disclosed, thrown and projecting, and for which its almost possibility for being is an issue. It matters to us. Both in its being alongside the world and in its being with others. Because uh, in, our, in our state, present in, in the state of mind, we find ourselves alongside with other entities in the world and with other Dasein. Now, for Heidegger, there is a need to define in an existential ontological manner the totality of the whole structure of being in the world. There is a need to inquire whether existentiality, facticity, holiness, and the other existentials have an ontological unit. What, what brings all these existentials together? There is a need, according to Heidegger, to grasp the structural whole of Dasein's average everydayness in its totality. Because without a unifying factor or a unifying existential, there could be no basis to go beyond the simple enumeration of existential. We will just enumerate all the existential and that's it. But there should be a link, something that will put them all together, some kind of an ontological ground. And according to Heidegger, this existential that unifies all these other existential is care. Care. So he said, the being of that sign upon which the whole structure as such is ontologically supported becomes accessible to us when we look all the way through this whole to a single primordially unitary phenomenon which is an existence, which is already in this whole in such a way that it provides the ontological foundation for its structural identity. So because of these requirements, there is a need to inquire first about one of the state of mind's angst or anxiety. The basic state of mind of anxiety is a distinctive way in which Dasein is disclosed. The instances of weird and uncanny feeling that is being, that of being disturbed in which the whole familiar world seems to lose its normal significance. Things that are familiar and intimate things, some kind of oddness and unfamiliarity. These are instances when angst, dread, anxiety manifests itself. So 
in our ever, average everydayness, we may feel or encounter some, or we may have some uncanny feeling, being disturbed, you know, things losing its significance. There are some kind of odd, you know, oddness and unfamiliarity. There is that feeling of dread or anxiety. There's also the feeling of not being at home. Now, these experiences or instances forces us to reflect upon our existence. And the phenomenon of falling is a point of departure. The dust sign's absorption into the day, the dust sign becoming a dust man, the dust sign fleeing in the face of itself from an authentic existence to inauthentic existence, there is always that feeling of angst, of anxiety on the part of the dust sign. So the natural tendency of the dust sign is to turn away from all these odd, uncanny, dreadful, anxious experiences. But according to Heidegger, in the very moment that we turn away from these things, we are confronted with the fact that we are actually turning from ourselves. We are turning away from ourselves. So our turning away from all these odd, uncanny feelings is actually a manifestation of us becoming face to face with ourselves. So according to Heidegger, what bothers the Dasein is its own existence. So, in this turning away, it discloses itself. Turning away from it discloses its being there. By fleeing, it discloses that in the face of which the dust sign flees. So he said, the turning away of falling is grounded rather in anxiety, which in turn is what makes fear possible. That in the face of what one has anxiety is being in the world as such. But wh why are we anxious? Why is there anxiety? Why is there angst? Because according to Heidegger, we care. We care for our existence. If you don't care at all about our state of being here in the world, if you don't care about our possibilities, if we don't care about our forgetfulness, then we should not be anxious. There should be, there shouldn't be any anxiety at all. But why is there angst? Why is there fear? It's because of care. We care about ourselves. We care about our existence. So, the being of Dasein is care. And it is the existential that unifies the existentials. Existentiality, facticity, and fallenness. Okay. So, <clears throat> There are two senses of care, to be concerned, okay, and to care for people. Concern about entities, concern about objects, no? that's ber sorhen, and for sorhe, solicitude, caring for people. So sorhe or care has two manifestations. 
we are concerned or we are we care about objects about entities but our gadgets and we also care for people all right now next point death and dasein this is second to the last Heidegger's analysis of death has nothing to do with the biological account of death. Like when uh, life lives and when death begins. And it's not concerned with the psychological account of death. Like for example, what happens during the last moment of our life. It's not even concerned with the theological questions like whether there is life after death. It's not about moral or ethical attitudes about death. For Heidegger, death reveals the temporality of our existence. It focuses upon our existence rather than upon the authentic day or day self. It becomes the ground for authentic existence. So for Heidegger, death is that important phenomenon which can expose the authentic and ontological basis of human existence. The very uniqueness of death is that while its occurrence comes frequently, many people are dying, especially during this pandemic, it will only come once for its Dasein, for each one of us. So death is something inevitable. Okay? Not only inevitable, it is something common. It is seen as the ultimate evaluator, the terminal point of our life. Death is that which will neatly tie up all our loose ends. So death should be seen as that perspective from which the end or the totality of our existence can be seen. Oh. As long as death is not is out of our grasp so too is our ability to see the totality of human existence so for as long as we don't see death as some kind of possibility that death is not yet then we'll just ignore it because as long as you know, as, as long as we are alive, then we can still actualize all our potentialities. However, once death arrives, that would be the final possibility. So it's the ultimate possibility for the Dasein. Of course, we don't want to die yet, but we are all going there. The Dasein is not only being there in the world. The Dasein is also a being not there anymore. As long as we are alive, there is the not yet. But we cannot escape this ultimate possibility. The possibility that will tie up all possibilities. It's finished. It's like the shout of the director cut. So according to Heidegger, death allows us to understand our possibilities. to understand our possibility that that is the last possibility but some people they focus on the not yet no i'm not going to die so i'm not going to die yet so i can just enjoy my life but remember while you are here 
you don't know when you will no longer be here. Some people focus on the not yet. Some focus, some people focus on the other possibilities. They don't prepare for these ultimate possibilities. So according to Heidegger, we have to be aware of this possibility. And therefore, we have to live our life authentically, every moment of it. That's the possibility that will tie up all the loose ends. No more. No more outstanding. Meaning there is no more possibility. Once death arrives, it will tie up if our life is like a sack, a bag. When we are still alive, a lot of things we can put inside. When death arrives, it will tie up everything and that's it. And your death is always, our death is always our own. Nobody can die for us. It's our own most possibility. It's something that we cannot avoid. It's something that, that is not chosen by us. It is part of our being in the world and part of our possibility. Of course, when we become aware that we are going to die, the mood that reveals to, uh, it to us is dread. We dread death. But instead of dreading, we have to prepare for it. Okay? So, the final one characteristic of the meaning of death, however, is its fallenness. The design tries to avoid the confrontation of the meaning of death try to avoid any discussion of it. There's a tendency on the part of the Dasein to exist inauthentically to plot various ways to avoid a true understanding of what it means not to be, of what it means not to, not, of what it means to die. So the day self, meaning that's the, the inauthentic self, Try to convince us that death is not really our own. It trivializes it to commonness. The day self sometimes seduce us into believing that it is not our own. But it's our own. And it's always a possibility. A possibility that we can never escape. So the authentic mood should focus not on the actual event of death, how we are going to die, where we are going to die, or how we can prolong our life, or how we can avoid death. But we have to focus on its possibility. We have to focus on its possibility. Because when we focus on its possibility, what do we do? We live our life authentically. Because it's going to come, then we have to be ready for it. So we have to focus on death so that we can focus on our temporality. Someday we will no longer be here. And therefore, we have to make the most of it, the most of our life. We anticipate the future. We live the moment. Seize the moment. Okay, lastly, Dasein and truth. Truth as Aletheia. So, we said that the Dasein is there. Disclosed, okay, unconcealed, open, revealed. This disclosedness of being of that sign is what truth means in the most primordial sense. Truth in the original sense 
refers not to an object but to the sign. In the derivative sense of the of truth, or, or truth, we can define truth as the conformity of the mind with an object. Okay. According to Heidegger, that definition of truth is a derivative trans, uh, derivative um, definition or meaning of truth. It's not an essential. <coughs> meaning of truth it's not that the mind conforms to the object because how can the mind conform with or to the object if the object is uncovered how can we say that an object is true if this object is uncovered and disclosed covered so the primary sense of truth according to heidegger is aletheia that means unconcealment or disclosedness or being open to be true means to be uncovered or to be unconcealed and it belongs to the dasein to disclose to open It's the Dasein that discloses entities, that allows entities to open itself. So the Dasein is disclosedness, and it is this to the extent it discloses itself to itself. The disclosedness of Dasein also points to Dasein as a throne project, as always already belonging to a definite place and time and as always disclosing its own possibilities so the design by disclosing its own possibility is first and foremost being true to itself so the truth as such is not something that is independent of that side there is truth only in so far as the sign is, and so long as the sign is, because the sign is in truth, meaning the sign discloses and covers itself. However, as we have discussed, it is always, it is not always the case that the sign is always in the truth, because the sign can also forget cover close itself meaning it can also be untrue the dasein can also fail to uncover entities including itself the dasein can also fall it can also be lost into the world no? it can also conceal other things therefore for heidegger there's no truth without dasein there would be no truth or aletheia without the world's disclosedness by the Dasein himself. So the reason why we can have truth as conformity is because of the disclosure of the Dasein himself. Okay. So the Dasein is open to a world because of its essential constitution of being disclosed. Now, the Dasein does not determine the truth. Only this, it's only disclosing. It does not constitute, the Dasein does not constitute the essence of things. It simply reveals, aletheia, the essence of things. The Dasein is the site of this disclosedness. And truth can only exist only as a mode of Dasein's being. So all truths are relative only in the Dasein's being. Relative in the sense that it is the Dasein that discloses. What is being disclosed is up to the, it, to the object itself. And truth as Aletheia would not be possible without the Dasein. 
Because there would be no Dasein to do the uncovering of entities within the world. So far, that's, uh, that's our discussion on Heidegger. It's a rather long discussion. It's difficult to, you know, uh, compress everything in one in one lecture. But uh, I do hope uh, you learn something from this uh, from this lecture or from this present or presentation. So thank you very much. <laughs>